International Press Club in Canberra. The Greens leader, Christine Milne, is speaking there. Aboriginal history as part of our curriculum, as has been suggested in recent times. It's hard to believe that we have a national effort to close the gap between Aboriginal health, education, life expectancy uh, with the wider community, and yet at the same time we have a government uh, set to uh, look at abandoning the education reforms uh, proposed by Gonski, which direct funding to the most disadvantaged schools throughout the country, and a government prepared to repeal laws that protect people from racial abuse. Is it any wonder that people right around the country are asking what on earth is going on? It's April Fool's Day today, and yet it's hard to be able to tell truth from fiction. So much has been turned on its head. One of the most loved lines uh, to make it into our collective culture in recent decades is from the classic Australian film, The Castle. And you'll remember it. It's the Constitution. It's Mabo. It's justice. It's law. It's the vibe. And uh, no, that's it. It's the vibe. Well, that's what I'm here at the Press Club to explore today as Western Australia goes back to the polls in an historic Senate by-election. And that is the vibe. The vibe of the nation right now. It's something you can't actually put your finger on, but it's there, it's real, it's powerful, and it's building. It's manifest in the thousands who gathered in the March in March rallies. It's in the uh, 850,000 people who watched our Western Australian Senator and candidate Scott Ludlam's speech when he admonished Prime Minister Abbott for his hollow three-word slogans and the intolerance, the discrimination and the climate denialism that are embedded in those slogans. The vibe's also in the conversations that I've been having in offices, on the streets, in the markets, in fact, everywhere. People are telling me that they are despairing. They've stopped reading papers. They've stopped listening to the news because they can't stand what the Abbott government is doing to our country and the speed with which it's doing it. The vibe's also there in the thousands who are standing up against coal seam gas and for farmers' rights to say no. It was also there this morning in the millions who woke up today feeling good about something for the first time in ages when we heard that the International uh, Court of Justice had ruled to stop Japanese whaling. But it's equally... <laughs> but it's also there in people who are feeling distraught at exactly the same time about the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change a uh, very sobering report on the state of the climate. It's also there in the laughter and ridicule of the millions who now see Tony Abbott uh, with his knights and dames and climate denialism as yesterday's man. It's also manifest in the reaction to the call for door knockers and campaign volunteers for the Greens in Western Australia. So far, more than 20,000 doors, 27,000 doors have been knocked on, 30,000 phone calls have been made by hundreds of Green volunteers, and there'll be more of that in the lead up to the election this weekend. These are people who care about our country, who know what defines us as a nation is hanging in the balance in this period of government. And these are the people who are committed to taking strong, immediate action to address climate change. And I know you're there in Perth today with Senator Ludlam and Senator Rachel Seawitt, and I say thank you and go for it, and I'll look forward to seeing you in the West tomorrow. But it's also the people at home who are sitting there equally asking that question, what's going on in our country, that I'm speaking today. Don't give up, don't despair. Instead, as German poet Bertolt Breck has said, don't start with the good old things, but start with the bad new things. Get active. Let's bring home the vibe to the heart of the parliament, to the Senate. 
make Western Australia this election the turning of the tide, make it the defining moment when Tony Abbott's extreme agenda is stopped. Make it the moment, as Scott Ludlam has said, when we take our country back. That's what's on the line on Saturday in Western Australia. In the seven months since the election, there has been a wholesale assault on Australian values. And we're starting to see the real agenda of Tony Abbott's government unfolding. Things that people regarded as certainties like our rights and our values, are being trampled. First is a love of country, uh, natural places, places that are too precious to lose. Abbott and his government are there for the big end of town, and they're tearing up environmental protection in the name of so-called red tape. Wherever we live, we all love the Great Barrier Reef. Now it's under pressure as never before from the consequences of climate change and coal mining. Our reef is dying as Tony Abbott has given the tick to the dumping of the spoil from the Abbott's Point coal terminal, adding to the pollution from Clive Palmer's nickel refinery, the agricultural runoff, in top, on top of the coral bleaching and acidification from warming seas heated by the very coal that we are digging up and shipping overseas. Tasmania's magnificent high conservation forests, listed in 2013 as World Heritage, are to be delisted and logged if Tony Abbott has his way. And that's in addition to high country grazing in Victoria's National Park, shooting in New South Wales is now considered okay, and the same is on track for Western Australia's national parks. Shocking? But it's hardly surprising when it comes from a Prime Minister who has said, and I quote, the environment is meant for man. It's an insight into Tony Abbott's Old Testament, Bob Santa Maria philosophical view. Farmers and the communities across Australia continue to be pushed aside by the Abbott government for coal mines, coal seam gas and non-conventional gas, regardless of the contamination of groundwater supplies. Tony Abbott is actually delivering for the big mining companies and his big business mates, sending the profits of the big three iron ore miners, Rio, BHP and Fortescue Metals, soaring, with collective profits of more than $14 billion in the, half, the last half year from their Western Australian iron ore mines. And that's made worse by the, the promise of handing back environmental powers to the states, to people like Colin Barnett, whose government has proven, has a proven record of conflict of interest in approving destructive projects like that at James Price Point, and whose cruel drum lines are killing sharks as I speak. This has to stop. Another value under assault by Abbott's cruel and secret and tricky government is our love for community and our belief in decency and respect in the way that we treat each other. Australians do think of ourselves as being decent, compassionate people who will help one another out in hard times. But Reza Barati's murder on Manus Island was a line in the sand for most people. As my colleague, uh, Senator Hanson Young, who's here today, has said, things have just gone too far. The secrecy driven by Scott Morrison's refusal to allow journalists and lawyers onto the Manus Island Detention Centre, on top of cruel failures to investigate claims of maltreatment by the armed forces, the removal of legal support services, and even news today that the Australian Federal Police have refused to send officers to help interview subjects, uh, suspects sorry, in Razor Barati's murder, all that has deepened misgivings that there is a shocking cover-up going on. Something is clearly very wrong. Australia's refusal to support a United Nations war crimes investigation in Sri Lanka and not to hold an authoritarian regime to account for war crimes and crimes against humanity is just wrong. And sending back more than 1,000 asylum seekers to Sri Lanka over the past two years, exposing them to continued persecution, 
and gifting two patrol boats to boost its anti-people smuggling capability shames our nation. We are becoming a global pariah in human rights, environment and climate change, and now our relations with Indonesia are at an all-time low. People are actually beginning to get quite frightened of a reckless and cruel and out-of-touch government and a maverick prime minister. They're asking, where are we headed as a nation? Are we headed back to the 50s era of racist, anti-gay Australia, where women were treated as second-class citizens, where LGBTI people hid, where abusive racist name-calling was OK, an era dominated by old, rich, white men, as Mona el said on Q&A last night, who wanted to be knights in a colonial aristocracy looking to London. We have a government with its head buried in the 19th and 20th centuries without a plan for the 21st century. And with no plan, Tony Abbott will fail as Prime Minister. No one, no one can lead at this moment without a plan to address global warming. It's a defining characteristic of leadership to identify the risks and threats to the nation and lead people to address them. The IPCC has made it clear. Time has run out. We're suffering already and we're on track for four degrees of warming and we're not prepared. The Greens are the only party in the Australian Parliament who recognise the two possible futures, as the IPCC has said yesterday. One future of inaction, degradation of our environment, our economies and our social fabric, or the other, seize the moment and the opportunities for managing climate change risk, making transformational changes and getting on with that job of creating those jobs for the future. We have to decide which path to follow, and the Greens have chosen the transformational change path. The government has not. And nowhere is this lack of a plan for climate change uh, more obvious than in Western Australia. Yesterday's report from the IPCC emphasised the enormity of the global task, and in Western Australia, the southwest of the state is drying out. Perth recently recorded its second hottest summer on record and sweltered through their hottest night on record ever at 29.7 degrees. Life will get harder with more heat waves, extreme fire danger days resulting in loss of life and loss of productivity. Tony Abbott is a fool to pretend that climate change is not happening and even more foolish to try to prevent the action that would help people, would create jobs, create a future for Western Australia and the country after the mining boom. People around the nation are worried that they already work hard, yet life's getting tougher for them. They're worried about everything from more jobs being casualised, uh, long commutes to work, ridiculous congestion and pollution, fly-in, fly-out pressures, too little time with their families, anxiety about the future as construction gives way to production and lost jobs in the mining sector. In Western Australia, people without work or who are underemployed worry they won't be able to find a place to live. They won't be able to afford the rent. And the list for crisis accommodation is blowing out. Western Australia has one of the least affordable and most pressurised housing markets in the whole world. Two weeks ago, I visited Foyer Oxford in Perth. It's got the capacity to house up to 98 young people, including 24 young parents and their children. The young people I spoke there described the place as awesome, and it was terrific to see that kind of identification with finally having a place to live. But the service providers have been left high and dry, with no promise of a long-term national partnership agreement on homelessness and just another extension for service but not for new capital facilities. The stopgap measure that Tony Abbott has promised is just that. It is not a solution. 
Abbott says to people, the Prime Minister says to people, trust me. But why should they, when so much of what he says is hot air? People's gut instinct is telling them that something is not right. And when a Prime Minister says, don't believe me unless it's written down, and then even then it's suspect, you have to wonder, and it's no wonder the community is recognising that they should trust their own gut instinct rather than the Prime Minister. The Abbott government is not governing for all Australians. They are governing for a greedy few, the vested interests of yesteryear, not the Australians of tomorrow. It's like a CEO delivering for just one small component of a corporation. Make no mistake, this is the the Tony Abbott, Rupert Murdoch, Gina Reinhart collaboration, directed and promoted by the Institute of Public Affairs. The Prime Minister said in April 2013, and I quote, that is a big yes to many of the specific policies you urged upon me, unquote. Referring to the Institute of Public Affairs, 75 radical ideas to transform Australia, and they're being delivered so fast that the IPA has added another 25 because they're going through the list at such a rate. Now, the question is, do we want to live in an Australia which is fashioned by Rupert Murdoch and Gina Reinhart and a forelock tugging Prime Minister? When you look at the big banks, what's happened with the financial reforms, it's a case in point. How is it possible? That, peep, that you can want to repeal a regulation that says that financial advice has to be given in the best interests of the client. What is wrong with that? If you take that away, you're delivering for the best interests of the people who are set to make the most from it. Take the mining tax as another example. Again, Tony Abbott is governing for the wealthy and the overseas mining companies and letting ordinary people suffer. Joe Hockey said yesterday, everyone in Australia has to help to do the heavy, living on, heavy lifting on the budget. Everyone, it seems, except the big miners and polluters who benefit from fossil fuel subsidies, polluting for free and maximising their profits. Everyone will have to take a hit in order to protect those profits. So, Joe Hockey, release the Commission of Audit report right now. Let's see who's going to take the hit in this year's budget, because we know it's going to be schools without the fifth year delivery of the Gonski funding. We know it's going to be the homeless. We know it's going to be single parents. We know it's going to be low income earners. And just the fact that Tony Abbott wants to repeal the mining tax, and in so doing he would strip away 533,613 West Australians strip from them 27,000 of reti retirement income by repealing the low income superannuation guarantee. So if you want to create jobs in Australia, the best way to do it is not get rid of the mining tax, but fix the mining tax, raise the revenue, end the fossil fuel subsidies and, and corporate welfare so that we can use that money and spread it around into research and development, universities actually growing the future. Now, where does this leave Australia with a new Senate due to take office in a few months? A Senate in which the government will have to rely on an inexperienced, uncertain and policy-free few. At last year's election, the community voted against the incumbent government. People voted, as Rupert Murdoch wanted them to, quote, to kick this mob out. Rather than voting for what Tony Abbott offered, they voted against the Rudd, Gillard, Slipper, Thompson spectacle. And that showed up clearly in the Senate vote. Having voted Liberal in the House of Representatives, people wanted insurance against Tony Abbott getting control of the parliament. But what the 25 per cent of the population didn't and couldn't have known was how voting for a raft of micro-parties would play out. Instead of stopping the Abbott government getting total control, the gaming of the electoral system made the Senate and the nation vulnerable to the very things that people wanted to avoid. Australia is now subject to the whims of people who secured less than 1% of the vote 
and who will be tempted to give Prime Minister Abbott everything he wants in exchange for who knows what. The crossbench will be a right-wing circus, even before the results of Western Australia this weekend, we know we've got one from the Australian Motor Enthusiast Party. He will want four-wheel drives in our national parks and precious environmental areas, and we know he's signed an MOU with Clive Palmer, but we don't know what the deal is. We don't know if any money changed hands, what promises have been made on policy. It is secretive. We don't know. We've got one from the Liberal Dem Democrats uh, who benefited from the donkey vote and who left the Liberal Party because he was opposed to John Howard's crackdown on guns following the Port Arthur massacre. We've got one from Family First who will oppose every effort to achieve marriage equality. We've got two unreliable, unpredictable Palmer United Party senators who are there for Clive, not for the country. One says one thing, Clive says another, and Clive wins. It's as simple as that. The numbers in the Senate matter, and they will determine whether the Prime Minister and the Conservatives get absolute control. I'm calling on the voters in Western Australia not to risk their vote on a micro party at this Saturday's election. If we can change the vote in Western Australia, if people in that state can return at least two ALP and one Green, even if the three Liberals remain, then Western Australia will change the nation. We will change the balance. We will move one vote from the Conservatives across to the Progressives. And it's this one vote that makes the by-election so important. And it's why we really need to, to focus on it. There's never been a more timely election with such clarity of outcomes. And the example I'd like to use is the Clean Energy Finance Corporation. It's been fantastic. $10 billion to go into renewable energy and energy efficiency. It's doing brilliantly, bringing down emissions, rolling out projects and jobs. Now, with the Greens, the ALP, Senators Mad uh, Madigan and Xenophon committed to retaining the $14.9 billion worth of investment in the 179 renewable energy projects, then this is a critical outcome for Western Australia. If you, that one vote moves, then we can save the Clean Energy Finance Corporation. It's as simple as that. It's rare that one state can make such a difference to the future of the nation. It also means we can save the, cli the Climate Change Authority, which has the legal responsibility for the renewable energy target. And if you want to bring down electricity bills, the best way of doing it is solar. The best way of doing it is retaining the renewable energy target as it is and increase it, not undermine it. And the Greens are out there loudly and proudly saying the future is in renewable energy. We want to get to 100 per cent as soon as we possibly can. <laughs> Now, Clive Palmer has declared his conflict of interest in carbon pricing. His company owes $8.4 million under the Clean Energy Package, with the potential of penalty costs to go up to $35.8 million. Now, he said he wants the price retrospectively repealed so that his company doesn't have to pay. Now, where does this coal billionaire's conflict of interest leave his two senators? And where does it leave all the other companies who have abided by the law? Surely his two senators can't vote to personally and directly financially advantage the leader of their political party to the tune of multi-millions. If it's good enough for him to abstain in the House, then it's good enough for them to abstain in the Senate. Otherwise, the precedent would be for corporations to use their profits to have their representatives directly elected to the parliament to change laws that adversely affect them. Forget the national interest. It would be democracy for sale. Now, the Prime Minister does not have the skills to handle an unstable crossbench. It's very clear. It will be a crossbench and a negotiation that puts the last period of government absolutely in the shade. 
And this will be Tony Abbott's undoing. His strategy has always been to crash and crash through. And he doesn't have the leadership skills to negotiate, to talk things through, and to deal straight and fair and square with everybody involved in the negotiation. He didn't tell his own party, even, about his knights and dames. You have to wonder, what if he won't tell his own party, how on earth is he going to negotiate with the kind of crossbench that's coming? And that's where the Greens' plan fits in. Only the Greens can make the Senate really work after July. We've done it before and we'll do it again. We've been always totally responsible in balance of power and through our negotiating skills, we delivered the clean energy package. It would not be there if the Greens had not signed the agreement with the former government. We negotiated denti care. It's because of the Greens that we have the Parliamentary Budget Office. There are so many achievements that we were able to negotiate. We, unlike the others who will be on the crossbench, we're a party that has a suite of credible, fully costed policies. We're not in this to repeal things for our own personal gain. We are there to deal with things as we see best for the future of the country. We have a holistic vision of a caring nation supported by a healthy environment in a rapidly warming world. And that's what we can be relied upon to visit. We will stand up against Tony Abbott's harsh agenda. In Western Australia, if you look at the plans we have, it addresses everything from rolling out a clean energy plan for the state, delivering jobs, delivering public transport, light rail. It's about building 214,000 new affordable rental properties including more than 21,000 in the West. And I'm delighted, and this shows you the calibre of Scott Ludlam, that the Institute uh, of Planning uh, of Australia awarded him a prize for the work he had done on revisioning public transport and housing and renewable energy and energy efficiency in the city of Perth. It's a fantastic contribution that Scott has made and he well and truly has earned a place in the Senate for Western Australia, but also for the nation. And I know everywhere I go, people come up to me saying how much they appreciate what Scott Ludlam has done for the issue of digital rights in Australia. He is the one who stands up consistently, consistently taking on the surveillance state, but also saying clearly, we need to make sure in an era of new technology that the rights of individuals are protected. I want to just finish by commenting briefly. We, unlike others, will not deliver for vested interests and the mates of the IPA. Not for us, the blast from the past, knighthoods and boards and trappings of office. Not for us, the trade-off for shooting and four-wheel driving in national parks. That's what you get if you vote for uh, individuals or parties that have no policies for the nation. This election really does allow Western Australia to vote for the future, to take into account the science of climate change, to deliver billions of dollars in jobs in renewable energy, in public transport, in housing and education, to save money on power bills by getting right behind the solar industry and giving hope and the promise of happiness to this and future generations by standing up for people in the environment in the face of what is the biggest power grab for the greedy seen in generations. So I ask particularly People in Western Australia who are now feeling the vibe, make sure you vote Green on Saturday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Milne.
Thank you for that uh, very hard-hitting address. I don't think you've left anyone in any doubt as to where the Greens stand vis this government. Um, I might just start. We do have a, a normal uh, period of questions from uh, reporters here, but I might just uh, kick off using the prerogative of the chair. Um, just to ask you to expand a little bit, little bit on the, um, the whaling decision in the light of the comments you've just made. You were very, uh, I think, um, direct in your criticism of particularly the coalition, but also the previous Labor government. Would you concede, however, that uh, the decision in the International Court of Justice on whaling may be one of the most durable environmental decisions that's, uh, that's happened uh, affecting Australia for, and, and indeed the world, for a very long time? Much more durable, uh, it may turn out, regrettably for you, than some of the things you've managed to force through in the previous term. And do you, therefore, concede that both major parties supported that action in the International Court of Justice and that therefore there was something to be said for uh, a broad political consensus? Uh, well, I absolutely uh, congratulate uh, the four ministers of the former government, uh, both Peter Garrett and Mark Dreyfus, who've done a fantastic job in The Hague. I think we can all congratulate them for that. They stood up strongly for the case and also their legal team. They haven't done it alone. There's been a terrific legal team there and I absolutely uh, support what they've done. And I also congratulate Sea Shepherd and all of the environment groups who for generations, not just the last few years, but decades, have been out there campaigning against whaling. So absolutely it's been a community effort and it's been a cross-party effort. But there has been a change of tenor in terms of the Liberal government. In opposition, Greg Hunt was all about having a cop on the beat in the Antarctic, remember? Until he became the minister. Then he wasn't nearly as keen on a cop on the beat. He withdrew from that promise. He didn't send the customs vessel down as he said he would. He instituted surveillance flights, which the head of the Air Force said would, would not see anything at an estimates hearing lately. So I'm glad that it, was, it actually went through and was prosecuted at a time when we had a Labor government committed to it and the Greens absolutely committed to it and a community movement right behind it. So I think it is terrific and I think it will be durable and I was really pleased to hear the Japanese say uh, that they will honour it. Of course, the issue now becomes what happens to whaling in other parts of the world, which uh, clearly has not been made clear as a result of the decision yet, although the court has shown that uh, it is inviting the Japanese to reconsider their position in other parts of the world. But it's a great outcome and it's the one thing that's cheered everybody up today, I think. Our next question is from Paul Osborne. Uh, Paul Osborne from Australian Associated Press. Thank you very much for your speech. I have a question on asylum seekers, uh, which you mentioned in your speech. Uh, Immigration Minister Scott Morrison said that the government's moving to a, ne a new phase, which is dealing with the people currently in detention. And I'm aware that there's actually asylum seekers in community detention in Canberra itself. Um, now, as far as that next phase of the policy, do you think one of the options should be a blanket amnesty for those currently in detention? Or what, what direction should the government take there? <laughs> Well, the, the Australian Greens have argued for a long time that our policy is not only against international law, it's against common decency and humanity, and that what we need to do is uphold our uh, obligations under international law and look after people uh, who are seeking uh, asylum in our country, assess their claims, and if they're found to be refugees, then bring them into the community and support them. That's always been our policy and it remains our policy. I fear when Scott Morrison says this is the new phase of another military uh, exercise uh, that we will see even more cruelty than we've seen before, although that's very hard to imagine what it might mean. But I think the overwhelming thing that's been shown in relation to asylum seekers is the propensity for this government, A, to try and push the blame onto other people, B, to pretend that they have no jurisdiction when it comes to Manus Island, when it suits them not to have jurisdiction, and to be incredibly secretive. The fact that they have switched their language. First of all, it was going to be stop the boats and now it's no boat arrivals. When asked directly the question, 
Well, how many people have you turned back? How many boats have you turned back? How what has happened to people? There is no answer. That becomes a security matter. So dressing everything up as security matters is a recipe for secrecy. And it's the excuse that was made in terms of the raid on the legal office in relation to the East Timor case, for example. It's now, what is the excuse for not allowing the federal police to go to PNG and be part of the interview uh, of people who are now suspected of the murder of Reza Barati? What we're seeing is cruelty beyond all measure. And uh, at the IPA uh, meeting at which Tony Abbott so welcomed their policies, he also said that he lives by the principle of do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Well, I invite him to consider that when it comes to asylum seekers. Next question. Next question from Nick Butterley. Uh, Senator Nick Butterley from the West Australian newspaper. Um, the Greens polled pretty badly in the recent Tasmanian state election. Um, if Scott Ludlam doesn't win a Senate seat in WA this Saturday, do you think that will have ramifications for your leadership of the Greens? Well, let me say that uh, I think the uh, Tasmanian election is where we draw the line underneath the uh, going out of the tide for progressive forces, if you like, and we're now going to see the turn of the tide and those forces come racing back in. That absolutely is the case. If you look at what happened in South Australia, our vote in the lower house increased. Uh, Mark Parnell's crossed the line. Congratulations, Mark. I uh, delighted you're back into the uh, South Australian Parliament. But I believe that Western Australia is going to be the absolute beginning of the uh, coming back in of the tide. And I think we will see that flow on into the state election in Victoria later this year. So I think uh, we're going to see Scott Ludlam do very well in Western Australia because people are starting to get to know what a great senator he is, the terrific work he's done, particularly in renewable energy and, as I said, in housing, in public transport, in digital rights. And uh, I'm confident that Scott is going to do well in Western Australia if people take a moment to think about how important this election is. If they want to see all those projects rolled out across the country, the big solar projects, the big energy efficiency projects, we need Scott back in the Senate and I'm pretty confident we're going to get him there. So that's not an issue that I'm going to be considering in, uh, in any uh, immediate short term and I'm pleased to see that Adam Bant is here today, my Deputy Leader, and uh, we are a strong and united leadership team. Peter Jean. Peter Jean from the Advertiser, Senator. You were fairly critical of the micro parties during your Address. I'm just interested to know, though. I mean, the Senate makeup is, you know, will be what the, the voters make it. Are there any issues that you think the Greens could work cooperatively with the more conservative uh, micro parties on? And if so, what are those issues? That's a very good question because who would know? Uh, one day there's one view expressed, and one day there is another view expressed. Uh, you would have to be virtually keeping on top of it hour by hour to know what the latest policy position is from any of them on anything. Obviously the things that they are known for we will not support. There's no way we'll be supporting shooting and four-wheel drives and the like in national parks. Uh, it's uh, pretty clear that we will be standing up strongly for marriage equality uh, regardless of how anybody else approaches the issue. And wasn't it great uh, to see David Cameron uh, the the uh, Prime Minister in England standing up there uh, saying that supporting marriage equality, celebrating the first same-sex marriages uh, in London and saying that this is not only important uh, in, uh, because it's a, an end to discrimination, it's important for the social fabric of the UK. And I thought, isn't that fantastic? And we'll be standing there. Uh, saying exactly the same things in the Senate regardless of what the micro other micros might have to say. But again, I come back to the point I made. I think Australians deserve to know from Ricky Muir what was in the Memorandum of Understanding with Clive Palmer. People voted for the motor enthusiasts as a separate party. They have a right to know what it is he's, he's ruled in or out or sold in or out. Roger Houseman. Roger Houseman for Inside Canberra. Senator, should you be successful in Western Australia, uh, where will you stand on not so core issues for the Greens like the NDIS and others that the previous government uh, have put on the roadmap? 
Okay, well, the Greens have been very big supporters of uh, uh, looking after people with disabilities, and we were right in there supporting the former government uh, with uh, the National Disability Insurance Scheme, as it was then known. Uh, and it is core Green policy, actually. Social justice is very, very critical to the Greens, as is ecological sustainability, participatory democracy and peace and non-violence. So we will certainly uh, be in there continuing our support for people with disabilities, just like we will be in there supporting uh, the implementation of the Gonski reforms in education. They are critical, too, to the future of our country. If there's one thing that gives every child the best chance in life, it is a good education. And there is no reason whatsoever why we wouldn't fund a public education system, but a system across the board that directs the funding to those students who are most in need. That is what it should be the basis of our society. And in this century where education is everything, imagination is the resource of the future, not iron ore. And so we need to be right in there supporting it. So we'll be doing everything we can. We were critical of the Gillard government for back-ending a lot of their reforms in terms of funding. Uh, at the time, they made the main funding for some of these reforms to support people with disabilities and to implement education in the fifth and sixth year. And we said at the time we should bring that forward and deliver more funding up front. They weren't prepared to do that. We could have fixed the mining tax and actually delivered that money to do it. It didn't happen. But nevertheless, we're totally behind those reforms and we'll do everything in our power to deliver them. Um, just before we go to the next question, if I could ask you to expand on that answer just a little bit. Uh, what about paid parental leave? That's obviously uh, one of Tony Abbott's uh, pet policies. Uh, you have a different view, but it does seem that there is room to negotiate there between the Greens and the government. Well, we certainly have a different view when it comes to fairness, and that's been fundamentally where we've come from. As a principle, we support um, paid parental leave becoming a workplace entitlement. But it's got to be fair, and it's got to be fair in the context of getting people participating back in the workforce and all the ways that, that might happen. But what it demonstrates is the point I made before about Tony Abbott not having the skills to deal with the Senate and the Greens actually having those skills. If Tony Abbott was keen about more than a three-word slogan, paid parental leave, he would actually have a plan. But he doesn't have a plan. It's crash or crash through. There's been no negotiation with anyone, no discussion with anyone, and nor is there likely to be. And that's why he'll fail. Because if you're going to deal with a multi-party uh, Senate, you have to have the personality skills to be able to negotiate. And you have to be able to negotiate in good faith. And I can tell you now, uh, Tony Abbott uh, has already not acted in good faith with me. I've had one meeting with him since uh, he has become Prime Minister. I went to see him about the Tasmanian forests specifically because he had said in the election that he intended to tear down the World Heritage listing and have those forests out for logging. I wrote to him and said, that's a bad idea. Can I come and see you about that? It will cost jobs. It will actually be devastating, not just for the environment, but the industry. So I went to see him about it, and he said, no, I didn't say that. And I said, well, you actually did. You campaigned on that in Tasmania. That's what you did say. And he said, no, no, um, what is already locked up is locked up. We just won't support any more forest being locked up. So I thought, well. That's extraordinary, but we welcome it. And uh, so I left the room asking for that in writing, in the light of what the Prime Minister had said about you can't believe anything unless it's in writing. And I never did get it in writing, I have to say. And now, under the influence of Senator Abetz and Senator Colbeck, uh, Tony Abbott is now making good the election promise. But in that one meeting, he told me something that he then completely turned on its head. So if you can't negotiate in good faith, you can't be a Prime Minister managing the type of Senate that we are now going to be dealing with. Next question is from Sid Maher. Uh, Sid Maher from the Australian, uh, Senator Milne. Um, you've been very critical of the micro parties uh, in, in your speech today, uh, a right-wing circus, you say. 
Um, will the Greens support, does the Senate uh, voting system need to be reformed given the results that we've seen at the last election and given the fact that we've got 77 candidates on the ballot paper again this time? Uh, and if it does, uh, do you have any ideas on what could be done? Uh, yes, I think it does need to be reformed and the Greens have long held, have long held policies of going to uh, optional preferential voting above the line. And uh, that would enable people to choose parties in their order of preference above the line. And, uh, but it's clear that neither uh, the Coalition or Labor are very interested in that as a reform. What we don't support is making it harder for people to participate in an election by bringing in really high fees for people to stand as a candidate, for example, or setting arbitrary uh, levels for what you have to get before you could be elected and so on. We need a fair system that enables people to contest an election but we need one that allows voters. See, the, the clear thing is about not preventing people uh, accessing the electoral system and accessing the parliament, but we need one that has a clear capacity for voters to be able to make clear what their preferences are and get rid of the, the requirement for people to do the preference negotiations and get those on the cards. So, Basically, what we're saying is let's give the power to the voters. I think a lot of people at the last election who voted for some of the micro parties would have been horrified about where their vote uh, ended up. And that's because the system was gamed uh, by someone who had the skills to be able to get a group of people together, work out the preference flows and organise it so that someone was elected in a way that the voters who voted for them could never have anticipated. And that's what's wrong about it. If you want participatory democracy, you need to maximise participation but maximise voter control over who and how they want people to be elected. Tom Eagleton. Uh, <clears throat> Tom Eagleton from the ABC, Senator Mill. Uh, returning again to the Tasmanian uh, election, your deputy Adam Bant said that um, there'd be a process by which the party would go out and speak to people uh, who didn't vote for the Greens this time round that may have in the past. Uh, to borrow your phrase, just wondering what the vibe is from that process, how much of it has to do with your leadership? Okay, well, um, there's certainly disappointment amongst the, the Tasmanian Greens, that's for sure, and uh, I have uh, not been uh, able to meet a lot of people since the Tasmanian election because I've been quite focused on Western Australia in the short term, but I'll certainly be part of that process as it gets underway. Uh, we've just really had the declaration of the polls uh, for a couple of the electorate at this weekend, so it's too early to be able to give you any um, feedback on that. All I can say is that the Tasmanian Greens are very keen to get a process underway, and they will. Um, but a lot of, uh, as with any state election, there will be a number of state issues and state uh, consequences. So from our point of view, it's about drawing a line under the Tasmanian state election, as I indicated, as being uh, the, the uh, low tide, if you like, and we're going to see the vote turn around now, and I'm confident that's going to happen in Western Australia, just as it started to do in South Australia, and I'm, uh, I hope that that is going to lead to incredible momentum where we really bring it home in uh, both Perth with uh, Scott Ludlam and in Victoria later this year in the state election. A question from Catherine Murphy. G'day, Senator. Um, given the Greens were the only uh, political party in the last federal election to actually comply with the parameters of the budget, Charter of Budget Honesty, by uh, putting fully costed policies in the public domain each day, do you see any merit? Uh, and that was a new, that was a new approach by the Greens in that campaign. Do you see any conceptual merit in? approaching the forthcoming discussion on commission, a commission of audit and budget sustainability on the front foot and positively with the government? And if so, what parameters would you put around that discussion? And a second question, if I may. Uh, it's been uh, reve revealed today, I think, that Clive Palmer again has outspent 
uh, all of the other uh, parties contesting in WA at the present time. This is a very difficult issue in a democracy to address, but have you got any bright ideas about how the playing field might be levelled? Okay, so um, just to deal with the, uh, the money spent in the election, it is quite alarming when you look at the figures to see that Clive Palmer has been able to outspend um, both the, the Coalition and Labor by some ten times, I think, uh, in Western Australia. I don't know how many more times that is than the Greens, but it's a lot more than ten <laughs> times. Um, but it is a concern that uh, when you have a wealthy individual prepared to put their money in and go wall-to-wall -wall advertising in advertising markets uh, like Tasmania and, and uh, Western Australia, uh, that is a concern about uh, whether democracy is for sale and that's something I think that the parliament needs to look at and consider uh, how you might address that um, into the future. Uh, especially when you see that there is such a conflict of interest in relation to some of the major policies that are on the board, like ab abolishing the mining tax or uh, getting rid of the clean energy package, which would uh, benefit uh, Mr Palmer personally. And I think these are really issues that are uh, of major concern to us. Now, the first part of your question, what was that again? Commission of Audit. Oh, the Commission of Audit, thank you. Well, the Commission of Audit is something uh, that the Greens have been calling to have released. It's absolutely wrong that people are going to the polls this weekend. The government has got the Commission of Audit. It knows full well what is in it. It knows who it's going to hit and how, and it's not prepared to tell people before the election. And the fact that that is the case tells you that it is going to hit a lot of people, that it is going to absolutely smash uh, some of the things that we've taken for granted in Australia for a long time, but we well, could also guarantee that the, pope, the people it won't hit are the wealthiest in the community. I would be delighted to be wrong if in this budget Tony Abbott takes away the fossil fuel subsidies to the big miners. I'd be delighted to stand here and apologise if that is the case, but we could be taking away that $2 billion a year that the big miners get in their rebate for fuels. Now, why should Gina Reinhart get that? Why should ordinary people out there in the community pay full price and the rich not do so? What is going on here with this big hit to low-income superannuation contributions, for example? I mean, we really need to know before this election, and if we don't, then people who vote for Tony Abbott then have to expect that they will get from this budget uh, a disaster in terms of cuts. But it doesn't have to be like that. We can raise revenue. That's the one thing people will not talk about, and the Greens are talking about it constantly, and that is we need to raise money. If we do want to spend money on education and universities like the Greens do, if we want to invest it in research and development, if we want national disability, we have to pay for it. And that means raising money to do so. And that's why fixing the mining tax matters. I mean, something like uh, mining revenues are about 10 per cent of GDP, but the, the employment figures are about 2.4 per cent. If you want jobs out of mining, then you tax the miners for their super profits, you get the money into the system, and you redistribute it through the system so that it creates jobs in the new sectors. That's where it makes sense. So we will be calling on them to actually get out there and release the Commission of Audit. Uh, but as to the detail, one of the absolute failures of this government is that Tony Abbott just doesn't have a plan. He has the three-word slogan, but no plan, no way of delivering it, and no personal skills to be able to negotiate it. Next question from David Spears. Uh, David Spears from Sky News. I'll uh, try and squeeze in two questions if the uh, chair will allow as well. Um, you've expressed a fair bit of optimism that uh, uh, Scott Ludham will succeed on Saturday. If he doesn't, how much personal responsibility will you take? And the second question is about uh, the Prime Minister's upcoming um, Asian tour, a, a heavy trade focus in uh, Japan, South Korea and China with uh, free trade deals um, on the agenda with all. How do you view these? free trade deals, do you have concerns about what they might mean for Australia? 
Uh, so first to the question of Scott Ludlam, and I'll say to all the people watching in Perth, you better get him over the line now, there's a lot resting on it. But seriously, uh, seriously, he's going to, he is going to do us proud, and the Greens in WA are going to do us proud, and I'm not going to entertain any notion of him not being there, just like I never would entertain a notion of a pulp mill on the banks of the Tamer River. I refuse to see it there. I did everything to stop it being there, and it's not there. I refuse to see a Senate without Scott Ludlam. He's coming back. And that's over to you in Perth. Uh, but to your second question on uh, trade agreements. This is really core. The Greens have stood up for a very long time and said that we do not support the current free trade agreement system because it's not a level playing field. The free trade system as it is is not fair trade. It does not incorporate into those free trade agreements the costs of environmental protection or the costs and of labour of putting in place decent labour standards. And until they do, you, it doesn't matter how efficient you are, as an Australian farmer or producer, you are never going to be able to compete on a level playing field because everybody has that stacked against you. And on the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the Greens have been saying absolutely no. We do not support the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And it might come as a shock to a lot of Australians to learn that Tony Abbott has already signed off on the uh, investor state a dispute resolution process. Now, that is a big uh, mouthful, but what it means is he signed off on allowing corporations to sue the Australian government for laws that they don't like because it reduces their profits. So, for example, because of what he wants to sign off on, cigarette companies based in America could sue the Australian government for plain packaging because it is diminishing their profits. Monsanto could sue the Australian government because Tasmania is a GMO-free state, for example. We cannot hand over our democracy to multinational corporations. It's outrageous. <laughs> And a final question today from Ken Randall. Uh, Senator Ken Randall from I sent here. Um, I was going to ask you about the Treasurer's comment yesterday that the government would eventually run out of money, but I think you dealt with revenue in the last <laughs> answer quite effectively. Um, but going back to the question of asylum seekers, the Canberra Times today has a, a long feature article by a former Deputy Secretary of the Defence Department ridiculing the objections of the military and the government uh, to claims that the whole process has been politicised through using the military. And he also criticises every aspect of the secrecy surrounding it. Now, you've had no success so far in extracting more information from the Minister or the Government about the processes in Operation Sovereign Borders. Do you have any plans to uh, increase that, the attack on that front? And do you have any sense of what the new Senate might think about that process as well? Uh, well, certainly, uh, we will continue to maintain the absolute pressure on the Abbott government to take responsibility for what they're doing, to, st to, try to stop hiding behind uh, the Navy and the armed forces, and to come out and be truthful to the Australian people about what is going on. People have a right to know. We have a right to know. We have a right for journalists to go into those centres and see what's going on there. People need to be able to be represented by lawyers. We need to have proper inquiries and investigations and not things being covered up. And it just goes to this absolute characteristic of this government. They're not up front with the Australian people and, frankly, when I see what Scott Morrison is doing now, I am reminded of Children Overboard. This started during the Howard years of hiding the truth about what happens. But the lesson of it is, it ultimately comes out. And it comes out because enough decent people cannot stand the lies and the secrecy and the misrepresentation. And history will show that this has been an appalling period of government in terms of human rights. And those people who are now responsible, those ministers, will be held to account. But in the short term, we'll do everything we can to expose the, the secrecy and the cover-up that is going on in relation to people 
who are accused of a crime when all they are doing is seeking asylum in our country. And I think when you get to see what happens in Sri Lanka when the United Nations now has its international inquiry into war crimes, you will see how disgraceful it is that the Australian government has appeased a regime that would treat its people with such cruelty. There are many people who in the future are going to be shown up for what they have done in, a, in the name of Australia, and that goes back to the vibe that I talked about. There are many, many people who are saying, not in my name, and the Greens are also saying, not in my name, and we will expose it at every turn. That's where we'll uh, leave today's proceedings. Can I ask you to show you